I will now open the floor up to questions. Masood? Yeah, on behalf of the United Nations Correspondent Association, thank you very much for this press conference. Ms. Angelique, my question to you is that uh, have you uh, identified the countries where this practice is most prevalent? And have you also identified the areas where, uh, I mean, uh, countries and areas where you can take this uh, money and create sensitiveness and awareness in the community to end this horrible barbaric practice? And uh, will, you, will you be doing that more? And can you uh, name, the, uh, name the country where this is worse? Back? Well, I think that um, doing that more is, not, is no question about it. Because till it's finished completely, I won't be at rest. I, my first experience with, um, with this topic, not my first, one of the most uh, um, overwhelming for me was when I was in Kenya with UNICEF and Oxfam after the drought, the drought before this one. And we were um, treating kids from malnutrition, I mean, weighing kids before following the, the nomad and the, the, the pastoral society doing what we have to do to alleviate a little bit of the pain of the drought, and that comes with health consequences that we cannot describe, describe here. And as I was coming back, uh, somebody came and joined us. I was with the mayor of the city where we were. And the person said to me, um, there is a delegation of Somalian elders that want to talk to you about girls' education. I look at my... Um, my representative of UNICEF that was with me. And I looked at her, I said, Somalia? Okay. If they want me to do something with them, we have to talk about FGM first. And then she looked at me with the big eyes and said, Angelique, you can't say that. You can't do that. I'm like, watch me. I didn't go to them and ask them to talk to me. They come to me. So they're going to hear it from me. So we arrive, and you have 25 men, elderly men. And I sat down, I'm polite, because in Africa, you got to follow the rules. So I was really polite. I'm like, OK, you got to talk, blah, blah, blah. And everybody started talking. And they said to me, OK, we want you, as a goodwill ambassador of the UNICEF, to come and help us put our girls to school in Somalia. If you have to build a school, we, we want you to come and help us put that together. And I said, I hear you. And I understand your need for your girls to go to school. But how, can you want, how do you want me to build a school and put girls that are caught in school? And I'm against that practice. Until you can tell me that you're going to be advocate for me, that you're going to fight FGM in your country, I can't come. So we got to sign the contract right now. You got to tell me what you're going to do to help me regarding that issue. And I can see my representative of UNICEF on the wall looking like <laughs> And the, there was a dead silence. And some of the, the elderly men were not happy at all that I brought that issue up. But I was not going to bang down. There was no way they come to me. I don't care what happened to me. They got to give me an answer at that moment. And the, the older man said, Mom, we hear you, and we understand what you're saying. Me, personally, I'm a, grandpa. I'm a grandfather here. And I see what it does to my grandchildren, my granddaughters. And I can't sit here and tell you that I agree with that. But the pressure of the society is high enough for me to sit by and watch it happen. But I can promise to you today, because you raised that question, that we will do everything in our capacity for girls not to be cut again. And once we reach that goal, we'll come back to you, and then we'll see. If we do that, will you come and build the school? I say, yes. Very good. Let me, add, yeah. Let me add, because I think you asked a specific question about countries. And I think it's important to contextualize it. What Angelique has said is very important in terms of commitment by local communities. In Somalia. In Somalia. But I think it's <coughs> in, we, uh, with UNFPA, with UNICEF, we've been able to uh, reduce this in Burkina Faso, in Djibouti, in Egypt, in Eritrea, in Ethiopia, in the Gambia, in Guinea, in Guinea-Bissau, 
in Kenya, in Mali, Mauritania, Senegal, Somalia, and Uganda. So these are the countries that communities have actually abandoned uh, the courts, uh, the, the practice of oh, female genital mutilation. And, and as I said, we have a total of about 8,000 communities that have abandoned. Mm -hmm. uh, and 2,000 in actually in, in 2011. My follow-up question is simply, actually, why is it that in this case, I mean, you don't ask these elders who are all men, usually, as you said, all of them, to ask some women to come and say as to what horrible uh, this, this practice does to their bodies and why it should be stopped? What is it that does? Why can't you uh, ask for more participation of women as against the elders? It is, it is such a... Um, it is easy for us sitting down in New York here to say why we don't do this, why we don't do that. Uh, there's a lot that have been done since the first time I've heard about FGM. And we have to celebrate that and put that in, in, into context. When you have been doing something for centuries, you cannot remove it in 10 years. It takes time. So that time demands money, demands trained people to deal with it. Every community have a different approach to this and have different reasons to this. So one of the things that I have faced in, this FG, uh, in the FGM uh, um, topic and, 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 and top problem is that women, most of the women that practice the cutting is the only job they have. It is the, the thing that gave them a status in the, in, in the family, the community, and the country. So here we are. How do we talk to those women to make them understand the dangerosity and the harm done to the girl in what they do? How do we replace that, that job? I hate the word job, but for the better thing, that's the one I, I can do right, use right now. How can we replace that job that give that woman a status in the society by something else? We have to all brainstorm and find solution to every community. And what works in one community might not work in another community. That is the challenge we face because Africa is a continent. We have to stop thinking about Africa as a country. In my country where I come from, we speak 50 different languages. It's not all over in Benin that they do cutting. There are places in Benin where they do cutting, not everywhere. So you cannot take that campaign and arrive in Benin and say, everybody's cutting this country. It's not everybody that is cutting this country. So it is, we have to, me personally, I would be interested in an approach where we take case by case, country by countries, women, men, religious leaders, um, politicians. politicians, because we need everybody on board for this to be a long, sustainable eradication of it. Because if we don't do it really deeply and take it step by step, we're going to come back 10 years from now, and it's going to be harder. Yeah. Isn't it true? Yeah. She's right. I mean, I, I think that right. I think the, the context uh, varies from country to country. Like this. And the fact of the matter is that you, you hardly, in some of those traditional communities, it is it's probably it's impractical for you to gather hmm. men and women together to talk to them. So you talk to men and, then you and talk, talk to, to women. women. Mm -hmm. And you, you have <coughs> to ensure that you can negotiate space for each of those in order for them to accept <laughs> what you are trying to do. Even in my country, people's behavior and attitude have, you know, are changing. For example, my little sister, who, is, who was born three years after my cutting, was not caught. So that means there was a beginning of awareness in, the, in my country already. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's a, I mean, that's a good sign. And yes. it's not in every family that the cutting is practiced. Okay. So we don't have to generalize and put every, every, everything in the same bag. Mm -hmm. You have to take, like you, as you said, case by case and work with people and hear, hear more voice, actually. I think that's more important.
cultural, uh, 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 there's the actual has uh, cultural aspect, but we here at the UN understand that you're promoting also resolution that has to get to the general assembly. This is a <coughs> the problem is being proposed here. It's been, you know, Italy with other countries have been working, but it's been, like you said yesterday on a press conference, has been like, you know, you have to be, you know, it's risky. It's risky because some, some country can be touchy, some, well, my question is very direct. You're not a politician, you're not a diplomat either. Uh, you're a professor. Um, since you have been uh, involved in this, uh, in this issue, we have been, uh, we heard country mentioned, Norway, Switzerland, country that support you. I want a more country. I, I don't understand why it's, we're only six or seven. I'm thinking, like, uh, what, why, I don't know. I didn't hear France, I didn't hear Great Britain, I didn't hear a lot of countries. What is being the... Okay, you great. Will see. Great to come, I just want to push, it's different. But it, the question is direct. What has been the main problem to get this resolution that hopefully you said yesterday, hopefully we will, will get it in this year. Why not before? What has been the main mission? The main obstacle in government? In, government. in, in Western government? Every, any, what is your being the problem well, to get that before? Well. First of all, you have just listened to her answer, and that is the explanation. You cannot just do like that, and it's the end of this. You have to convince people, you have to rearrange situations, you have to change the belief of an entire community, possibly. And so it's not an easy thing to do immediately. It takes time. And you can just outlaw things, but it's not done until you reach people, until you reach communities. Absolutely. And this, uh, our government uh, shares. This view, our government shares. And so we want to be with them. We don't want to uh, push them too much. We don't want uh, to act uh, in their substitution. We don't want to substitute for them. It's their duty. We want to be supportive to this, uh, but it's their job, as uh, uh, Angelique said brilliantly. What and I, I completely to, share her view. What I want to add to that is, we have a history of the rich country telling all the time the poor country what to do. Not only on FGM, in every issue. Okay, so the African leaders are president put in place or not put in place by their people. They have a legitimacy in their country. So the way to bring this to them is not to summon them to do something. Exactly. It's to talk to them and ask them to act individually in their country because every president in, in whom country this is done have to deal with different level of stuff. You just don't go out there and say, okay, religious leader, you don't do this anymore. I mean, you gotta have time to do these things. And um, I think that in the future, what we all have to tend to, together to do when all those meetings are happening is to give the chance to the countries in Africa to come up with their own solutions sometimes. Not to be telling them all the time what to do. It has been going on for so long, the double standard. Do what we tell you to do, don't do what we do. And if we're talking about FGM also, one thing that is really linked to FGM also is poverty. The woman that do the cutting, they pay her for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, end to end FGM, we have to tackle also poverty. How do we tackle poverty? By doing business with African countries in the way that some part of the income that the country generate with their own wealth with their own raw materials, some of it come back to develop the country. For the last 50 years since the independence, all the richness of the soil of Africa have helped the rich country become richer and the poor country become, stay poorer. How can you explain to me in the 21st century that Africa, that is the most richest continent on the planet, have the highest number of poor people on the soil? How can you justify that? How does that math work? How can you stop that immediately? You fix right, poverty, right. you fix so much problem. Job, you create job, you get rid of poverty, yeah. you, you tackle, and at, at the same time, when you, if you deal with those two things, immigration stops, FGM will stop, and 
I mean, early marriage will stop. Why people are doing that? I mean, there's so much that is linked to poverty and lack of education that we, it's a whole. We got to start thinking about the African country like legitimate country that can do what they want to do for themselves. To sit down and negotiate with the people, not with a gun on their head, but to tell them, OK, we give you this and we share this. More sharing, get rid of inequality, gender inequality, FGM, HIV and AIDS. There's so much that can go in the drain in a heartbeat if we start decreasing poverty in Africa. She can be a very charismatic politician. No, <laughs> not going to work. Yeah, you can. No. You are. Let you me are. be the civil society person you talking. You are, you are. Uh, yeah. Thank you. The next question of the... We'll see, we'll see. Do you have a question? Here. No, here? Well, first of all, I've just talked of tonight's event, and we consider this very important, also to raise Western awareness. Your colleague asked before why Western governments <coughs> were not so keen on this topic before. Probably because they did not think about it, probably because they were not aware. So raising awareness uh, is uh, an important thing. Uh, not in, in the long run, but in the short run. So these uh, uh, events like the one that we will have tonight are very important. The second one is working with the African governments, African leaders, African people um, to help them understanding. Uh, and this uh, I consider, let's say, a gentle pressure we can exert not more than that, but a gentle pressure. And third, we can do something in our own country, that is in Italy, because we have a community of immigrants and we know that although in a very small scale, luckily, but the practice uh, continues. Uh, continues. So we want to stop that. And again, it's not just by outlawing it because it has already been done, it's, again, a question of education and awareness. And we are fully engaged and fully committed to this. Can I just add that to say that I don't think I would, I would put two things beside. You were talking of resources, but I think the political support and the political so will is, very, is key in addressing this issue. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the Italian government being in the forefront and driving it is an important issue. And, and, uh, and, and once you do that, you can actually bring together a partnership, uh, including UNFPA, UNICEF, and, and civil society to take this forward. So you create a momentum uh, sure. which goes far beyond, beyond. Exactly. the Italian Absolutely. government. Exactly. <coughs> Absolutely. One more question. No, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank our panel for this incredibly interesting, fascinating, and hopeful, passionate and hopeful presentation, the hope that this problem will be taken care of very soon. I want a photograph with Angelique. <laughs> we have our photographers ready. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.